Okay, welcome everybody. Welcome back to the series of protocol guest talk series. Uh, the series is a part of an 18 week program where a cohort of 34 researchers are exploring the various aspects of protocols. You can find out more at summerofprotocols.com. Today we are talking with Matt Webb and our session uh, next session is next Tuesday uh, with Kyle Matthews on designing soft protocols. Uh, the pre-meeting reading material is linked there in the program calendar, again, at summerofprotocols.com. And uh, with that, I will hand it off to Venkat to introduce our guest speaker. Uh, we will be doing a little bit of a different format today, so stay tuned for some information about that. All right. Uh, thanks, Josh. And if you could post the Discord thread link in the chat, uh... Uh, I'm not sure if Matt is uh, on the Discord, but uh, uh, yeah, we try to keep our conversations on the Discord for the record. But uh, yeah, to do the intro today, I wanted to do it slightly differently because I think Matt has one of the last remaining blogs in the world. And usually when I'm in a room like this, uh, I tend to be the oldest blogger around uh, since I started my blog in 2007. But by then, blogs had already become kind of like a seven or eight year old technology. And Matt's blog is, I think, uh, oh, I don't know, the, uh, one of the most classic style blogs still around. So I highly recommend you go look at it. It's got like a truly blog style um, writing on it. And recently, he's been writing about uh, AI powered clocks and um, this um, article on like uh, AI in a loop, I think is one of the most interesting things I've read about AI. Highly recommend you go read it. Um, but also like a lot of people who started out blogging, including me, Matt is hard to introduce. So his about page is actually kind of interesting to look at. So he consults for Google and writes an internal publication uh, for them. Um, he founded uh, Berg, which uh, I think is the first context in which I heard of him. Um, he's written a book, uh, does consulting. Um, so um, and yeah, there's a bunch of London accelerators and stuff. It's kind of surprising to, uh, when you uh, when I first chatted with Matt about this uh, thing, I didn't realize he was British, so the accent threw me off for a minute. Kind of always weird when you realize somebody's British after reading them online with an American accent. But all right, so that's Matt. And um, the reason we invited him, and I'm glad this program uh, gave me an excuse to connect with him, is that just as we were thinking through um, this uh, project, including this program, and writing the pilot study, Matt wrote this uh, uh, article, Who Could Write Protocol Fiction, which is the pre-read for this talk. And I think it's one of the uh, many signs of like kind of a synchrony going on out there in the web that lots of people are thinking about this at the same time. And again, highly recommend it uh, if you're thinking of exploring sort of the art and uh, literary side of uh, protocols. Um, there's a great blog post. Uh, but with that, um, I'll hand it over to Matt. And I believe he has a workshop style format for us. So over to you, Matt. Hey, thank you so much. And great to see so many people here. Um, yeah, so I figured what we'd do today is I'm going to talk for like 15, 20 minutes, uh, and then uh, hopefully we can break out into separate rooms, and um, we'll do like a kind of a short exercise for about 10, 15 minutes, and then come back and discuss. So there's like, there's nothing like doing a bit of, um, a bit of practice, uh, but I will, uh, let me see, I'm going to share my screen, and I am, oh, let me actually share a different one. Yeah. Okay. Right, we'll not be able to do sound. So I've got some sound later, but I will, I will talk over it instead because we won't need it. Um, and... Let me see. Yeah, here we go, right? So as a kind of a recap, I'm not sure how many people here read the pre-read piece um, about protocol fiction from last year. And I guess to kind of like, uh, I wanted to build on that, right? So I kind of want to talk about the thing that comes after the fiction, 
which I'm going to talk about as desire and belief. I'll be posting these slides as an essay version later today, and they've all got brightly colored backgrounds to distract you from the fact there are only like two pictures in the entire thing, which is going to be enormously tedious. So if it helps you to kind of close your eyes and see this bit of a kind of a podcast, please feel free to do that. Um, like a little bit about me. Uh, I have a background in technology and design, usually kind of inventing new products with technology, which is um, brand new. Uh, so I've co-founded a design consultancy, written about neuroscience, um, been working in AI for uh, like the last 90 days, right? Which is kind of like a long time. And the most recent thing um, I made uh, just in my kind of spare time is this AI clock, which gives you a new poem every minute. Uh, which hit the New York Times recently, and foolishly, I'm trying to make connected hardware once again. So if you kind of want to know about that and follow along the progress, please go to poemtown slash clock. It's one of the things that's keeping me busy. Um, and the essay, the protocol fiction essay, just to kind of recap what that was about. Um, I'm talking, uh, like, I guess the starting point was I was wondering how do we end up with new infrastructure, like new national infrastructure, like a drone delivery network or an ecosystem of like biannual health checks based on like MRI and AI without requiring uh, the state or a giant corporation to do that? And one answer is to grow like the internet, right? You know, first of all, you imagine a kind of a future network of actors with aligned interests, and then you define a protocol that explains how to work together. Uh, even when the network is tiny, with incentives for people to join that network. So, you know, when ARPANET launched, I had four nodes. And I think that kind of explains the sense that I'm using protocol in. Um, a certain kind of protocol is a technology of cooperation. So that's that's kind of how I'm talking about it. Um, you know, you imagine your future, you write your protocol that allows for, you know, permissionless innovation, anybody getting involved, and creates a kind of a new commons, you know, where there's interop mutual cooperation and wide participation, everyone benefits without the gatekeeping of value. Uh, but the challenge is getting started. So when I was thinking about protocol fiction, that was kind of what was in my head. Um, you know, the, the point of the fiction is to think your way through the future system, but also to articulate and transmit belief, right? By way of showing a plausible path to a reference implementation um, of the minimum viable network, and also to transmit desire a compelling visualization of the future. And today, that's the piece I want to talk about, um, the belief and the desire. I'm really just talking around it, right? Like the, I don't have answers. I'm hoping to find answers um, with you all today. Uh, but I want to try like many different ways to get into this. I was really taken with um, this uh, cybernetic description of an aircraft factory from the science fiction author Bob Shaw. Um, it's in his collection, Tomorrow Lies in Anguish. And I think this is this is one of the things that comes to mind when I think about like self-sustaining uh, networks, autonomous networks, really. Um, it's a description of an aircraft factory as something which is always working. Um, it's a machine for producing aeroplanes. Uh, you don't tinker with it. Uh, one must seek out in all its ramifications and destroy the machine for stopping the production of aeroplanes, which lurks like, like a parasite within the organization. And that's one way, I think, of getting a, a protocol network operating. Um, you know, stop energy lurks like a parasite within the organization, so kind of root it out. And reading this, I remember this kind of like changing my point of view about how to build systems. In the sort of like specs, and protocol world, I think one of the people who best kind of embodies this point of view is uh, Dave Weiner, um, the creator of both RSS and podcasting, uh, which wasn't just kind of protocol design, but also community and network bootstrapping. And he distilled like his lessons, you know, his kind of understanding about how to do this in this incredibly like and typically for him straightforward essay, classic essay. Rules for Standards Makers from 2017. There are 18 rules. Here are eight. Uh, and they the, the entire thing benefits a kind of a close reading, right? Um, the first rules are about um, creating belief that it's possible to work together. So like interop really matters. Software 
matters, users matters more. Um, the later ones are about reducing friction. One way is better than two, uh, freezing the spec, remembering that developers are busy. I think what Weiner doesn't say, and this is because he's so good at it and takes it for granted, is that you also have to create desire and a kind of a gregarious desire. Uh, people have to easily see the value and want to get involved and they have to tell their friends. So that final rule, praise developers, is a nod to that. You know, positive feedback uh, and imitation are core to human nature. So, you know, like what are some ways of thinking about this desire aspect with specs and protocols? I think another reference point when I was thinking about protocol fiction was design fiction, right? So the practice of design fiction, which was sort of established by Julian Bleeker, um, but kind of came out of the air right then, is responsible for all kinds of like very public charismatic visions of future products. Uh, Bruce Sterling talked about it as like the deliberate use of diegetic prototypes to suspend disbelief about change. He means like making things that look real in real near future environments. And that usually happens via video. So like Kickstarter videos, right? They kind of follow the aesthetic tropes of design fiction. My favorite one um, is from 2015. And it's this one, which is Disco Dog, which is like totally worth watching, right? Like it's a dog in an LED coat walking around the streets in New York in the dark uh, and you know it even has lost dog mode so when you kind of lose your dog it gets out of range of your phone it just has lost dog appearing on a little strip and it didn't you know the prototype existed when they made the video and then that makes you think it's real um there's something about this gorgeously shot prop in the context of use that makes you trust it and also want it enough to kind of open your wallet so that's not all design fiction is like it's worth I think like digging into this, if we can use it as a reference point, um, I think to highlight how it works as a practice um, and its kind of effects as a practice, I recommend Matt Ward's essay, uh, Design Fiction as a Pedagogic Practice. And he he highlights um, a whole bunch of uses of this kind of, you know, charismatic prototyping. You know, he talks about design being ideological. He talks about fiction as a testing ground for reality. Um, the two I would really highlight, um, one is the practice of using fiction in design is a kind of a thinking through making. So um, it's a reminder that the use of narrative, um, because it includes environment and users and the thing and the networks and the whole context, the, the narrative is a way of kind of giving that a runtime. So it part, becomes part of the design and development loop. You're not just making kind of like a uh, an advert for the thing. But the other thing he points out is that um, design fiction has this incredible ability to persuade. The ability of, you know, to persuade, to create desire is like an intentional selector in the evolution of whatever you're, you're designing. And I think that's because design operates in the market, right? Like it's commercial art. The ability of artifacts to persuade is what we want. And like a protocol network, same, same, right? Hence, I think protocol fiction. So I'd like to add something to Matt Ward's description, which is um, the centrality of like material artifacts. I think artifacts have an ability to enroll and align different tribes of people in a way that like text doesn't, or even conversations of people don't. Um, a material artifact creates at its best a kind of a boundary object, um, things that translate themselves to all kinds of different tribes and allow those tribes to communicate with one another even when they're speaking different languages. And by different languages, I mean like engineers and marketing people or designers and MBAs or users, um, tribes like that. And there's a magical role of self-evident prototypes to align those different tribes and get them talking to each other. Um, so I think when we're talking about something like design fiction, the role of the material artifact is like that, but projected into the future. So I think that's that's one of my big reference points when I'm thinking about protocol fiction. I should give an origin of these terms, why I'm kind of fixated on desire and belief as something which is important to create. Uh, it's from um, criminologist and sociologist Gabriel Tart um, from the 1880s. Um, I know nothing about him other than a few articles uh, that I read like maybe uh, 10 or so years ago and it just kind of inscribed itself in my mind in a way which has never left me. Um, 
At the bottom of internal phenomena, whatever they are, the analysis pushed to the limit will never discover more than three irreducible notions, belief, desire, and their point of pure application, pure sense. I think I want to I want to just carry this forward a bit more. So Todd has this uh, like believes these are the most important um, forces in the universe. There is nothing else. Everything is de derived from uh, belief and desire uh, to the point that um, there's this great write up by Stephen Shaviro about um, Todd sociology. Um, Todd denies the existence of high level entities. Um, there is no such thing, he says, as social laws and regulations, social norms or social impositions. There are only power relations among individuals. Certain individuals impose on others. Certain individuals are imitated by others. Social coherence is merely the result of imitation on a mass scale, together with raw power impositions. So it's a kind of a statistical mechanics approach to sociology, right? All you've got are these two things, desire and belief. Um, imitation and imposition, uh, and everything else is kind of built out of that. Um, and he translates that to all of physics, which I, you know, I love. I'm not suggesting we use this here, um, but I love the line that the only explanation for the apparent uniformity of nature is that one particular hydrogen atom dominated the others, forced them to obey it, or induced them to imitate it. So I find this such a brutal and mind-opening lens. And I think beyond thinking through making um, and, you know, the those benefits of the practice, this is what protocol fiction must achieve if it's going to create something which is real in the world, um, desire and belief. So I want to show three levels uh, for building desire and belief, uh, three ways of doing it at different scales. And let's start off at like a really familiar microscopic level, um, which is Stripe. So the story of Stripe, you know, internet payments was told in Business Week, I think, back in like 2017. And their headline at the time was like, how two brothers turned seven lines of code into a nine billion startup. I think the valuation today is like 50 billion. So, you know, it's a good multiplier. And I remember those lines, right? Like all a startup had to do was to add seven lines of code to handle payments, a little bit of JavaScript on your homepage. The more jaw-dropping moment for me, actually, was when they were still called Dev Payments. And uh, this was, I think, the homepage of Dev Payments at the time, or at least the one I can find. And half the page was given over to um, that code on the right-hand side that you can copy and paste into your terminal. It was a little, little curl command. Uh, you pasted it in, and you immediately received a token for you know, test cash in your account. And just in that, in that second, in that half a second of copy and paste, you immediately got belief. You could see how to integrate it and desire you know there were dollar signs in your eyes all kind of futures built built on that kind of like dependability and trust uh just sort of resed in in front of you so one of the questions i ask is like what's the smallest way to have that kind of experience what's the smallest thing you can do that can build that level of belief and and desire okay so that's the microscopic let's look at the macroscopic Back in the uh, 1950s, there was a belief, I think, or not really a belief, like kind of rather a common and unstated understanding about humanity's future in space. And uh, this is, you know, the, there's, a, there's a big role here for like science fiction's established future history, um, which I can't remember when it was written down, but this is the future history that was kind of shared amongst all the, um, uh, the short stories at the time magazines like Analog, uh, which has been called the consensus cosmogony. And so the idea was that uh, when you read a story, you would immediately kind of know where to sit, situate yourself in this future history. And we kind of recognize it now, right? Like we start, the idea is you start exploring the solar system, flight to the stars, there's a galactic, galactic empire. The galactic empire rises, declines and falls, there are dark ages, there's a renaissance, and then um, inevitably, like in the James Blish books, there's a kind of a challenge to God. They create new universes, become energy, you know, energy beings, um, time ends, like those kind of things. So this was kind of sitting in people's head. And then when humans were sent into orbit and then landed on the moon, this became confirmation that we were on this path, right? If step one is happening, then also steps two through eight, right? 
and it's exciting. We want it to happen. That was the role of the science fiction stories at the time, propaganda, like creating desire. Activities, any activities become easy when they align with social consensus. Um, once established, you know, the consensus, you don't get stop energy from doing something which matches it. And then given the sort of the Brownian motion of activity in society, we collectively tend towards that future. Um, think of Moore's law as another kind of like shelling point in action, um, which isn't just an agreement, but it's a kind of a self-fulfilling agreement because of the, the Brownian motion of um, activity around it. Um, there are other social consensus futures, right? Like I grew up in the end of the Cold War. I assume that by this age, I'd be living in a nuclear wasteland by now. Uh, climate change is one at the moment. And all of these things kind of are both beliefs and, um, you know, self-creating beliefs. I think it's interesting that as wild as the consensus cosmogony is, what makes it work is that there's a pathway and the space race gave it plausibility. So you've got belief as well as desire. Um, you know, it's, it's not just enough to kind of imagine and articulate like the eventual future. You need a pathway like this so that your disciples and evangelists can hand wave the future. Um, so like one of my questions when I'm thinking about like painting these new futures is how do you give people that picture in such a way that they really, really understand it? And how do you provide a plausible pathway to get there? And it can just be kind of sketched out, uh, but people need to kind of be like, oh, okay, I think I get that. Um, one final way of looking at this, um, and this is kind of like, uh, a different way around um, of looking about bringing out the future is that you need different kinds of activity, different types of activity, um, and not everyone is specialized at doing all of them. So you need to enroll different people in the bringing about of the future. And um, this is from a uh, fictional non-fiction book in Kurt Vonnegut's Bluebeard. Um, the character Paul Slattinger writes a book, the only way to have a successful revolution in any field of human activity. And he puts open, puts forward that you need a mind opening team of three sorts of specialists. So you need somebody who's an authentic genius, uh, capable of having like good ideas, not in general circulation. Working alone, they would be uh, ignored as a lunatic. Um, second, you need a person in good standing. Um, working alone, again, they can yearn out loud for changes, but fail to say what their shape should be. Uh, but what they can do is they can testify that the genius is not mad. And the last thing is you need an explainer, uh, somebody who gets a kick out of saying anything in order to be interesting, and exciting. And on their own, they would have only shallow ideas and be like dismissed. But working with the other two will be able to explain these um, deep ideas. I think it's not as obviously about belief and desire. But I think it's another way around the understanding that these different functions are needed if you're going to crack open the world. Now, I've used the word propaganda um, a couple of times, and it sounds like a kind of a dirty word, as does advertising to some people. Um, but my favorite piece of persuasive di design fiction probably ever is actually a, uh, a TV ad from um, about 17 years ago. Um, so I'm going to... I don't think we're going to get any sound here, but I'm just going to play this. So it's for Zurich Insurance. Wait, we we had sound. It was working. So if you want to play it for us, that'd be great. Oh, wow. Okay, I'm going to play that. I thought um, awesome. the privacy thing wouldn't do that. So I'll play that. What happens if your latest product goes global in a single bound? if our fitness plans are stronger than our retirement plans? What happens if tomorrow's cars need a whole new kind of insurance? What happens if your business model changes every four hours? At Zurich, we consider all sorts of possibilities. It's why for over 130 years, we've provided relevant, secure insurance solutions for a changing world. Zurich, because change happens. I think one of the things I like most about that ad 
is that the scenarios of like a commute, commuter on prosthetic cyborg legs and like algorithmic robot cars are just as ridiculous as old people snowboarding. And those are kind of like parallel ridiculous visions of the future. And there are a whole bundle of apps um, at the same time. There are vignettes about like auto inflating full protect, protection jackets, uh, people in suits who care about mental well being. That's also regarded as ridiculous. But for me, this is like, this is belief, desire, and material artifact as boundary object, like all wrapped up into one thing. You kind of find an alignment between, you know, you and your business and insurance company. We have to put ourselves in the shoes here of like large corporations. Uh, but I think this kind of works really well. And it kind of gets the uh, stage people in the insurance company thinking about what are we going to do about, um, you know, sort of like insurance for robot cars 20 years in the future in a way that would be impossible to communicate through PowerPoint, say. Um, that said, I think we have a kind of a growing immunity to video nowadays, like working code is better. Um, so let's see, if I could like list some challenges, and we're not going to do these today, we'll do like one, right? If I could list some challenges for the designers of protocols, it would be to sit and imagine how to do the following um, in like ascending levels of scale all of which are about kind of how to, how to bring these things into the world. The first is like, how do you create belief and desire? Belief and design, it says there, that's a typo. Uh, belief and desire for your protocol. Like beyond the reference design, what are some practical activities and potential artifacts um, that could be done? I'll talk about that in the next slide. Second is like, what's the protocol playbook? And then like looking across like all the things that could be done, the startup world knows how to create belief and desire. You know, there's the law of landing pages and the ability to measure and iterate with funnel analytics and A-B testing. And what are the equivalent tools in, you know, the protocol building world? And then how do we manifest uh, like a society that has this protocol focused mindset? You know, like society believes that building the future is the province of corporations, a state and possibly viral social movements. These are all like other technologies of cooperation. And we used to reach for protocols to do this, the internet, uh, we don't know. So what's the best first intervention to get society to think about this again? I think what I'd like to do now um, is just think about that kind of first challenge. Um, I'd, like, I'd love to get people to like uh, bring some ideas so we can discuss. And I was wondering if it would be possible to do this. Um, I would love to somehow um, separate out into breakout rooms and take as a kind of a case study. Um, maybe let's pick one protocol, like out of the groups, somebody who's working on something. So you've got something kind of in mind and briefly describe that future world. So, so we have it written down. My usual line for this would be like, write it in length the tweet, uh, but tweets like went to 280 characters. And now I'm not sure how long they get, but you know, a one, one or two line description of that kind of future world. And then in discussion, come up with three different self-contained activities and artifacts to build and propagandize belief or desire uh, with the, the purpose being to enroll new actors. Um, and those could be, those could be any, kind of, uh, any kind of things, but if you kind of feel like you have a one or two line description of something, my recommendation would be to jump off and talk about something very, very different. Um, I would, um, I'd be, uh grateful if you could whiteboard these as you go um it's always nice to have something where uh when we kind of talk back to each other we can we can look at something written down together um as a, as opposed to just hearing talking um i can recommend if you don't have a tool for this already using tl draw um it's just a a nice tool for kind of scribbling together um, if you use the menu in the top left corner and choose file new shared project, it will give you a URL you can just kind of share around without having to sign in. And you can all just kind of scribble with uh, multiplayer cursors together. And then let's come back and uh, share out and discuss um, in like 15 minutes. How does that sound for timing? Welcome back, everyone. But um, is Josh here? How many? So how many rooms did we have? Do we know? We that? had four rooms. 
forums. Fantastic. Well, why don't we um, why don't we go around uh, one person from each room? Just kind of um, give us a summary of what you were talking about. Um, who from room one would like to uh, run us through what you uh, what you said? I think we may have a challenge in, in just figuring out who room one was. Ah, uh -huh. right. Did anybody? We were. I'm going to volunteer Toby or Steve. Why don't you do it? No, sure. You. Do you have the slide thing we can throw up? The whiteboard? Um, so I think that we talked briefly about protocols for, there it is. Um, sending people uh, emails that required, or messages that required you to send, stake a little bit of money to send the message. So that if the person you're sending the message to enjoys your message, nothing happens out of the ordinary. But if the person you're sending the message to says, hey, this is spam, I don't like this. I don't wanna see it, I don't wanna hear from you. They can take your money. And so the idea is that each, each account receiving can set up their own category for, uh, how much it costs to send them a message. Mm -hmm. And so we've done a little bit of uh, brainstorming on how to like kind of frame that as topping up your Gmail and having, you know, searchable public addresses and everyone doesn't have as much concern about putting their message, their email or their contact information out there because it becomes expensive to send you messages. Um, you can signal with the messages whether or not it's more or less valuable or you know, sit down with your morning coffee, open your inbox, hey, there's money, you know, instead of, hey, there's spam, the spam comes with money. Um, trying to incentivize reading the messages potentially could happen there uh, and set a lower limit on pricing. It seems like there's going to be multiple accounts so you can make your spam folder that you literally just never check. You just take the money that anyone ever sends to you. So maybe this like reduces the overall spam problem. Uh, Yep. So two things I really like in what you just said there, um, just kind of picking out just like my kind of top two favorite things. Um, one is that phrase topping up your Gmail, which just feels like kind of a really, um, a really crisp behavior for something which is very, very abstract. And just like immediately, like, I'm like, oh, okay, I can see myself doing that. Um, and another thing I really liked was when you talked about um, people are no longer scared to put their um, contact details out there because it's expensive to send them messages and like i think there's um there's always multiple ways to to motivate people to do things uh one breakdown i've seen is like fear hope greed and despair right and this is this is addressing a, a fear thing you no longer what and with hope right you you no longer need to be scared and it makes you realize you were scared all along and now you're not and that's great um room two And if, if we can't figure out a volunteer from room two, we can just kind of go for the first alphabetically and make it just feel like who was who was in room two. Yeah, with us. Is that our our group? Um, I think that was us. Okay. Cool. Oh, thank you. Okay. Anybody want to volunteer? I can just start talking about it. It's fine. Okay, so um, in our group, uh, the protocol that uh, we are um, looking at is one where you get to um, basically um, kind of say goodbye to um, the, the people who have died in your life at your own pace. It's kind of about asserting more control over the um, the grieving process um, and saying goodbye. And um, it's, it's happening through technology that, um, you know, we're, it's, it's more of like an affirmative effort to preserve memories, um, of the, of the dead, um, whether, uh, through like AI versions of them or, um, like a place to collect your memories online that people can share and uh, remember and talk about, um, the dead. Um, and that there is a process that um, when you're ready to, um, or there may be specific holidays during the year when there's like an archiving of the electronic 
relationship that you have maintained with the person that you have lost. And um, at that point, right, it comes off the uh, the information, the data about your lost loved one comes off the public servers and you're given like a, a memory stick or something uh, like that as an artifact of your memories and you can preserve that how you how you want to, a certificate uh, marking the moment. And so it allows you to prolong your relationship with your loved one until that moment when you more formally say goodbye. Feel free to add uh, people if I've missed or misdescribed things. I think that Any was other extremely particular... comprehensive. I love this. Are there any other um, particular practices or ways of kind of bringing it, uh, like concretizing it for people that anyone else wants to add? We talked about what you can do with your memory sticks. You can have like one of your, like those picture frames at home, maybe where it stops being in the public domain, but you have a, a picture frame where you can insert your memory stick and have, have it um, kind of like they're dead publicly, but maybe you even um, get to play that at home. Um, there's a comment from Kia that I copied out of the breakout room chat before it disappeared, which is there could be like a, stages of the death for the sort of personal data archive. For example, it begins living on um, servers and is revisited yearly. So it's still kept, for example, by Twitter. Um, then it's removed there and given over only to a family owned USB. Um, and then after another period of time, there's a ritual of final death where the family um, transfers what did you write, Kia? Uh, which is marked by public evolving portraits of the deceased in place of public cemeteries. Um, so that's like a sort of sci-fi sketch for what such a protocol could look like. Wonderful. Um, just to check before I make any comments, are people okay to run on for another 10 minutes so we can hear from the other groups? Um, I understand that we were supposed to be going to the hour, but okay, we'll, we'll carry on for a bit and then if people need to drop off, they can. Um, by the way, like room two, this is absolutely gorgeous. Um, I'm, you know, admittedly, I'm kind of like a sucker for ritual and tradition, but I think the the thing which is really sticking for me is the specific annual holiday, um, because I think there's there's something really um, uh, there's something doing something which is kind of very public that people can join in with and has that kind of regular time to it. Um, is a great way of uh, enrolling more people and creating, you know, stopping things, you know, both drifting, but also kind of growing the practice. So I'm I'm very into the idea that there is kind of archiving day. And I wonder, I wonder like what day it would be as well. Like that's kind of a, a question which is kind of in my head. Can we, so th thank you very much for that. Um, I'm, that's going to stick with me, I think. Um, room three. Um, who do we have here from room three? Um, I can go ahead and talk since I was chatting a lot during the uh, the, set, the breakout room. Awesome. Let's share my screen. There we go. So our um, sort of protocol was a way to imagine a world in which people can instantly alert others to the presence of hazards. The location and nature of those hazards are stored in a social memory. Hazard info automatically appears to individuals as they come into proximity of the hazard. Um, and so are the three artifacts that we or like movements or actions or ideas that we were going to use the, as propaganda for this were like the first one is um, like a union of the future. So some way of all the workers in, on the planet have a way of communicating with each other and banding together. Um, some form of communication, organizing themselves um, to gain power against employers. And then the second thing was like a really straightforward symbol-based tagging system based on what you might understand is like fire, um, construction hazard, um, transportation risk, biohazard, radiation. And then the last thing was some way of crowdsourcing certification so that we, we know like an employer is, good they respect the use of this tool 
um, if you go work here, you know that you'll be able to use this tool and access it without any sort of um, interference. Yeah, we worked out some of the like conflict uh, or we were talking about some of the like potentials for conflicts in, uh, in that, which was kind of interesting. Uh, I don't know if anybody else from the group wants to talk about that, but the, just like the potential for like, you know, what do you, if you're, if you're obviously you're, you're not, you're going to want that. Uh, you're going to want that if you're, if you're an employee, but like, would you want it if you're an employer, but then if you didn't like, how would you, uh, um, like, what are you going to deny the workers, like the safety, like what, uh, so there's kind of a, a, a dynamic there, a power dynamic there. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add, um, like, we were thinking a lot about how, like, so much of, so much of the improvements in, like, working conditions, for better or for worse, like, at least in the United States, have been consumer driven, and um, it feels to me, like, over the course of my lifetime, like, the consumer has become more enlightened and, and like demands more ethically sourced products. Uh, but for some reason, at least from what I can tell, that hasn't expanded to include workplace safety. So this sort of certification might be like a badge that a that a product could have on it that would make the consumer demand um, safer conditions for the people that made it. And um, that pressure from consumers could really lead to um, employers like having to embrace a protocol like this, whether they otherwise would have wanted to or not. I'm, I'm glad you said that because that's the thing which was um, which was I was turning over in my head while you were kind of speaking. Where which is kind of like where's the um, you know almost like where's the fight, right? Like a it, it feels like the the use of a protocol like do constitute a kind of a, a social movement in a way, which means kind of they need mission and you know kind of like they need to be zealots in a way and how are people kind of empowered to do that and the idea that there is something a bit like a uh you know a kind of a b a b corp idea or something that people can rally behind or that sets up a kind of bit of opposition or fight um and some companies some organizations can align and some some don't um that feel feels powerful and it sort of like starts unpacking that idea of a union in the future, which I would love to hear more about at some point. Like the the idea that, that it's possible to have almost like a kind of a new a new way of running unions, which doesn't work in a traditional way, but has uh, has more of this kind of like growth around it and more kind of bottom up seems really really intriguing. Um, so yeah, like tons to tons to think about here. Um, also quite, you know, I, I think that's kind of the merging of the tagging, a, a bit of the tagging system, right? But as an external thing and the uh, and the movement aspect. Uh, but this kind of focus on like adoption and growth, I think is kind of what I'm, what I'm, you know, the bit I'm kind of like zeroing in on here. So thank you. Um, and finally, uh, room four. Who do we have? Who can who can talk to room four? Kara, do you want to go? Yeah. Kara, I don't know if Kara does, but I, I can do it. Kara was the, the excellent note taker um, here. So um, just see if I can share this. Um, so I... I volunteered this bristlemouth protocol, this marine hardware uh, standard, basically the USB for the ocean that we've been working on. And um, I think I kind of screwed up the exercise because um, we've been we're we're a little bit further along. And so I, I was starting to say this to the group, but in this case, what was really interesting to me um, in the process of starting this this protocol and then growing it was that. There, the belief was so important, but there were different like scales of belief. So at the very beginning, believing in this protocol looked very different than trying to convince like the Navy to adopt it, which is gonna look very different than getting hobbyists to adopt it. Um, and so that that's, we, we kind of 
we're talking about the meta ideas of what kind of storytelling builds the the variable type of belief that you need. And um, we also talked about this idea of cataloging, which um, is kind of a parallel idea to, to science fiction. Um, Hugo Gernsbach kind of pioneered this. I mean, he was famous for, uh, you know, being a promoter of science fiction, but he was also um, selling kits and like electronics kits and, and radio kits and had a, a whole world of, um, you know, providing catalogs. And that was kind of a different type of writing that had a much more direct effect on technology. Um, and so the way I've been thinking about this and what we kind of talked about was this idea of the, the stories and the fiction that's being created actually being interwoven with the kits and the tools that are available to the hobbyists and the people who you actually want to adopt it. So it ends up not being like science fiction or fiction in the way we traditionally understand fiction, but a kind of messy um, hybrid of both fiction and kind of tool selling and things like that. And it's a, it's, I think it's actually really important for um, uh, the adoption of new technologies. And, um, you know, so that's kind of where, what we talked about. Thank you. There's a, there's a really famous piece of um, design fiction, I think, which is a catalog from the future, uh, which is by um, Near Future Laboratory, which I'll have to dig out and share around. But yeah, the kind of the, uh, the power of kind of like dropping artifacts through kind of a, from a parallel world back into our reality, um, you know, creates a, creates a lot of belief. I'm going to see if I can kind of try and summarize some of this um, on, on the fly. So some of the things that really kind of um, stuck in my head are thinking about the uh, the kind of the behaviors of people who are living in the future world as normal. Um, so like topping up your Gmail, like really kind of like stood out to me there because it just kind of makes everything feel a lot more believable when you go, oh, we talk about it in the vernacular. Um, that's very powerful. Um, I'm also taken with rituals and social movements. So the um, annual holiday for archiving or a, a union in the future um, or something which provides a badge for um, consumer pressure. Um, I think the, um, you know, thinking about, thinking about uh, protocols as evangelical movements is a, is a kind of a, uh, a powerful way forward um, too. Um, and I think, one of the things that um, I'm kind of left with thinking about um, in a lot of this is, um, are there any kind of standard ways of creating these artifacts and doing the communication? Um, how on a kind of a first read of these quite complex things are people going to understand what's going on? Um, people who are new, um, and is it possible to kind of make that almost like a deliverable artifact from whatever this kind of summer is, for whatever protocol you're working on? And how can those kind of be shared around? So I haven't, I don't know about this already. Um, I don't know how, you know, this kind of, um, uh, this summer is going to be kind of like brought together and disseminated. Uh, but that's kind of really in my head about this, because it would be awesome at the end to look across all of it and go, what's the playbook for everyone else? Um, so those are the kind of things which are in my head. Um, after that, I know we've kind of run over time a little bit, um, but if anybody else would like to carry on the discussion uh, for another 10, 15 minutes, um, I would love to carry on um, just as a kind of an open, open chat. Um, otherwise, um, for anybody who needs to drop off, uh, I'll be putting this, um, putting this kind of like uh, provocation on my blog at interconnected.org, um, probably later this evening, UK time. So in a few hours, I'm going to rewrite a little bit based on the uh, based on the conversation today. Um, but thank you very much for coming and thank you for participating. Um, and best of luck with the rest of the summer. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thanks so much, Matt. Um, for anyone who wants to stick around, uh, you can stick around and continue the conversation. Uh, I will stop the recording here shortly, but just as a reminder, our next talk with Kyle Matthews uh, will be a similar kind of workshop style. And that will be on Tuesday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So thanks again, Matt. Thanks for having me.